Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, my name is Kevin Buzzard, and uh, I'm a professor of pure mathematics here at Imperial. And uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, is, uh, will a computer be able to do my job? Uh, so, I mean, that's a question that maybe many of us would have. Uh, but I'm specifically going to talk about you know, my personal job, because it turns out to be quite an interesting uh, theoretical question as to whether we can uh, uh, get machines to do mathematics. So, brief history, in 1997, a computer uh, defeated the world chess champion. Uh, this was a bit of a shock, uh, because in the 1980s, chess computers were very poor, uh, but then they got better and better. IBM threw some money at the problem. In 1997, uh, they became superhuman. Uh, in 2017, a uh, computer defeated uh, the best human Go player. Go is an oriental board game. Uh, it's in some sense much more complex than chess. It's played on a much bigger board. Um, and again, this, was a, this, big, this came as a shock uh, because on the whole, Go computers uh, were sort of average Go players. But uh, using AI, DeepMind managed to uh, create a computer program that again became superhuman. Uh, so these are board games by this stage. It, uh, you know, the claim was that basically uh, you know, computers had now you know, had solved board games. Uh, and now the question is, uh, what happens next? Uh, so maybe will pure mathematics uh, be next? So uh, will a computer be able to do my job? So I really have to explain uh, what my job is. And in some sense, uh, parts of my job are analogous uh, to playing board games. So what does a pure mathematician actually do? A part of my job uh, that I won't be talking about, but is a very interesting, uh, you know, very interesting question, will computers be able to do it? Part of my job is teaching. Uh, I teach undergraduate classes ranging from small classes of 20 to gigantic classes of 300 you know, first years, fresh out of school, going to a compulsory introduction to proof course. Uh, and as well as that, I have one-on-one -on -one discussions with undergraduates at smaller problems classes and things like this. So one could ask, can a computer do those things? And I mean, it's getting to the point where you could kind of argue that computers could do those things. You know, we, uh, you know avatars could take my place uh, on the lecture, on the lecture theater, and uh, maybe some kind of chatbot uh, could do my job uh, instead of a one-on-one -on -one conversation. But maybe some students wouldn't want to be taught by computers anyway. If they're arguing, they might be arguing that they're paying good money and uh, want to have access to human experts, perhaps. So I'm not going to talk about teaching. Uh, what I'm going to talk about, though, is uh, research. So what does research in pure mathematics look like? Well, uh, what do we do in pure, what is pure mathematics? It's kind of like a game, kind of like chess. Uh, but there is one big difference between pure mathematics and chess, and that is that uh, mathematics starts uh, with the counting numbers, one, two, three, four, five, uh, and there's infinitely many of those things. So chess is kind of a constrained, finite problem. It's a very large problem, but it's a finite problem. But mathematics uh, is, I mean, the, the technical term is mathematics has an infinite action space. And so this is why you can't just get an AI that's very good at chess and then point it at mathematics and say, you know, now become an expert at mathematics. So what does research mathematics look like? At school, you, do th you, know, you learn algorithms for you know, adding up two-digit numbers or multiplying two-digit numbers. And uh, so you might kind of think maybe at university they're just adding 100-digit numbers. Maybe that's what research is about. But of course, that's not at all what's going on. That kind of question we leave to the computers now. Computers have been better than us at that kind of question uh, for a very long time. Uh, what we try to do is we try to see uh, detailed links between things. We spot patterns. Uh, I, I just give an example. Uh, my slides are really speaker notes. But uh, an example of a profound question in mathematics is the Langlands philosophy. Uh, and what this does is it takes some objects uh, which are defined uh, using continuous techniques using things like the real numbers, which is a one-dimensional object, a smooth one-dimensional object that you can you know, move continuously along. Uh, so that gives rise to things like calculus and analysis. That's continuous mathematics. 
and we can make some complicated objects using continuous mathematics. And then there's some other objects which you can make using completely different techniques, using discrete mathematics. That's back to the counting numbers again. One, two, three, four. You see, if you're at four, you can't sort of wiggle around a little bit. You're either going, you're jumping one unit down to three or one unit up to five. It's a different kind of mathematics, but more combinatorial. Uh, and any kind of conjectures that link the discrete to the continuous, these are regarded as somehow profound conjectures because they're giving us some strange insight into the way that all these different aspects of mathematics, like sort of geometry and algebra and arithmetic, are all somehow glued together. So that's what humans do. We kind of try to get some kind of idea as, you know, as these complex objects that perhaps don't even exist in our universe, right? These things exist in some kind of platonic universe. Uh, and we try to get some kind of feeling as to how they operate within that universe. And the question is, can, you know, can, uh, you know, can computers really deal with that kind of abstraction? So I want to talk about large language models. So ChatGPT is the most famous example nowadays. That's, a, uh, that's some kind of model that's been trained on the entire internet. And uh, so you can start asking it mathematical questions, and it will start rattling off solutions in the confident way uh, that it does if you've, uh, if you've ever tried uh, to use this software. And if you give it uh, pre-university level stuff, what's an example of a pre-university level theorem? Maybe Pythagoras' theorem. Uh, it would rattle off a proof of that, no problem. Or there's an old, there's an old theorem of Euclid from his elements, uh, the proof that there are infinitely many prime numbers. And if you ask ChatGPT to prove there's infinitely many prime numbers, it will rattle off a proof, and it's the proof straight from, uh, straight from Euclid's 2,000-plus-year-old book. But the moment you go beyond school-level mathematics and start asking about university-level mathematics, or maybe in research-level mathematics, uh, then these tools instantly... Uh, start falling down. Now, they do very, very poorly, even at undergraduate level, because somehow the stuff that they've been trained on, uh, there's far less stuff that they've been trained on there. So by research level, uh, these, things, these things are very poor. And one of the main reasons that they're very poor uh, is that they just make stuff up. And this, and this is not problematic in many... I mean, if you're asking computers to do art, then making stuff up is exactly what you want them to do. Uh, but if you're asking them to do mathematics, that unfortunately, uh, mathematics has rules in, in the way that uh, art doesn't. I mean, uh, mathematics is more like chess. If you start to play a game of chess, and then at some point you just decide to make an illegal move, then, then what you're doing is no longer playing chess, right? It's somehow become a different thing. Uh, and of course, what you should really do, you can't make an illegal move, you have to put that move back, and then go back to playing a legal move. So just the same, if the computer is rattling off some mathematics and makes one move that isn't 100% that isn't valid, then all of a sudden, that entire mathematical argument uh, becomes invalid. So this is the problem uh, with ChatGPT, is it makes stuff up. So now I want to tell you about another technical innovation, and that's the interactive theorem prover. So what's this? Uh, well, let's go back to chess as an analogy. If you want to play a game of chess on the tube and you're by yourself, then maybe you could pull out your phone and just use a chess app on your phone because, uh, because chess apps exist. Because chess is a well-defined game with well-defined rules, so you can tell a computer program the rules of chess and tell it to start looking for the best moves and uh, your phone can play chess. So an interactive theorem prover is a computer program that's been told the rules of mathematics. And so that means that now you don't have to do mathematics with pen and paper, the way that researchers often do, uh, you can play the mathematics game on the app. So that's an interactive theorem prover, and one great thing about an interactive theorem prover is just like you can't cheat in a chess app, you can't, move, you can't make an invalid move in a chess app, you can't make an invalid move in a maths app either, in an interactive theorem prover. You can't make a mistake. It's impossible. The system just flags it instantly. But the problem with these things is right now humans are writing the code. It's humans are writing that code, and then the computer is checking them. So those are the two tools I wanted to talk about. There's these large language models, which will happily rattle off you know, stories about anything you like, including mathematics, uh, but might well make stuff up. And then we've got interactive theorem provers, where you can't make mistakes, uh, but unfortunately, humans are typing these, things, typing these things in. And so, of course, the weakness of each of each system is the strength of the other. So a very natural question 
is whether we can put these things together. So who's putting these things together and giving us some kind of human computer collaboration and also some sort of maths computer science collaboration? Who's doing this? Not the mathematicians. It's quite surprising. Mathematicians are quite a conservative bunch. So the tech companies are doing it because they can see that somehow if they can solve chess and they can solve Go, then maybe mathematics is next. And people in computer science departments are doing it. But on the whole, it's not mathematicians. So I, th I think that's slightly strange. But uh, where are we up to? One of, perhaps one of the reasons mathematicians are, getting, are not getting involved is because right now the state of the art is quite poor. Uh, right now, we can get a large language model. The idea is, instead of training large language model on English, let's train the large language model on the language of the interactive theorem prover, and then start getting the large language model to write proofs where we are guaranteed that there's no mistakes. And the state of the art right now is that they're a smart school child. Uh, so smart school child, so there we go. Here's a maths question. Can we prove that if we start with one and then double it as many times as we like, and then we add one, we never get a multiple of seven. So there's some sort of slightly quirky maths question, and we ask that to the computer, uh, or well, I mean, more precisely, uh, because a tech company asked this to the computer, and the computer wrote some kind of code. This is just like chat GPT, but writing computer code instead of English language. And this code compiles, and therefore, this is a valid proof of this theorem. So that proves that the idea works, but it also proves that it, this is, it gets at least this far, but this is about as far as it ever really gets. So I just want to wrap up. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, one particular mathematics community, the lean mathematics community. Uh, this is a group of mathematicians who are teaching not research level mathematics, but just the statements of undergraduate level mathematics and master's level mathematics to an interactive theorem prover called lean. Uh, and right now, this is just a big open source project, people doing this all over the world, doing it in their spare time, because mathematics departments don't really reward uh, that kind of effort. And yet, the idea of building a computer brain that somehow as smart as an undergraduate is somehow the next, uh, is the next possible step. Uh, so this is just an example of what looks like computer code, but it's actually very, very recent mathematics, uh, you know, uh, that the won you know, the, the Fields Medal in 2018 have been translated from human language uh, into this computer language. So that's about it. Where are we going? I guess within a few years, we're going to have at least one of these interactive theorem provers will know an entire undergraduate degree, uh, and it will know more than that. It will start understanding not the proofs, but maybe the statements uh, of big conjectural problems like the Langlands philosophy. And then the question is, once we're at that point, can we get the large language models, which will, of course, in a few years' time, be much, much better, can we get the large language models to start solving problems uh, which, humans can't, which humans can't do? So if you talk to AI people, they say we're on some exponential curve. And they may or may not be right. These things may or may not get so good so quickly that they will just put people like me out of business. I'm not so sure, but uh, uh, we're going to find out all too soon. Uh, thank you very much.